she owns a four mouth tentacles tentacle mask that reflects back all psychic damage at its source, makes her immune to all mind flare grapple attacks, and stores six arcane spells cast into it earlier that she can cast forth by silent effort of will. Hey Unwell Met and welcome back to more Realms lore from the original creator of the Forgotten Realms himself, Sarah Ed Greenwood. Hello. And today we're taking, I wouldn't call an ordinary, but uh, uh, an easily grokkable location, Waterdeep, we are all, we're all quite familiar, and just cramming some wacky into it, because the title of this video is Spell Jamming in Waterdeep. And I'd like Ed to explain a little bit more about that to you. Sure, well... If we're interested in spell jamming, we realize that it involves ships flying through the skies. And we all know Waterdeep is a crossroads city, a bustling cosmopolitan trading hub. Why aren't its skies full of spell jamming ships? And if you need to spell jam in or out of Waterdeep, where do you go? Who do you see? Well, wonder no more. See? That's big brain stuff. If you think about it hard enough, it all makes sense. <laughs> if you're enjoying these videos, please consider becoming a protector of the realms by heading on over to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, where you can support Ed directly, but also it helps us continue making these videos for you here. So uh, yeah, please enjoy Spell Jamming Water. Now departing non-stop for the Astral Sea. Spell jamming into and out of Waterdeep in the 1490s DR. So, if ships can sail the skies of Faroon, why is it they're not seen overhead daily in Waterdeep? Is it just due to the city's infamous wards? Well, no. No one operates directly out of or into Waterdeep because that would give certain guilds and trading costers and masked lords and wealthy city, city individuals wanting noble status and established noble families all fits. To say nothing of Vajra the Blackstaff, Lady Laryl the Xanathar, and various sinister individuals who want to conquer the city. All of the above roster of folks would frown on spelljamming ships openly, that is, visibly, to folk of the city, flying to, or from, or over, the city. Unless, of course, they personally controlled them. However, consult your Enverons of Waterdeep map, as in the second edition web enhancement of that name, penned by noted realm scholar Eric Boyd, and regard ye these locales. 1. Northeast of Mount Aradin and the ruin of Olothontar's lair, is a tiny valley amid four mountain peaks. This is Hidden Hail. The best way to get to Hidden Hail legitimately and without suspicion is to exit Waterdeep via the North Gate and set out along the high road as a caravan, hunting party, van visiting some locale along the high road, or so on, and then stop at the Wild Stone, a roadside shrine to Sylvanus, located just east off the high road, about a mile away from the city. Leave an offering of at least 25 gold pieces in some form of currency on the altar of Sylvanus and make a request to walk wild to one of the shrine's guardians. High-level priestesses of Sylvanus, there were four human clerics who staff it in shifts, Brithra Tulmoon, Kathara Nelver, Gavalahana Hrolmaster, and Fanalome Tirist, and they are all pleasant but also veteran adventurers and well-armed. And they will use secret words to open a gate or portal from just behind the altar to the Nask Sack estates outside the fort on the slopes of Mount Sar, to a spot where stone markers set into the ground guide faithful of Sylvanas off into a grove for private personal worship. But of course, you can instead stride to Hidden Hail if you know where it is. That walk is about a quarter of a mile around the curve of a lightly forested tall grass hillside and then downhill onto level and heavily forested, but there's a walking trail, to a glade ground. 
The wild stone is a huge, 16 feet high, egg-shaped, and so about 22 feet long and 14 feet across, but split, so the crosswise dimension is over 20 feet, older, and erratic in glacial terms, sitting about 60 feet back from the roadside ditch that flanks the high road. It cracked and split in half centuries ago with a gap between the halves that's about eight feet wide, and an oak tree is growing up in the middle of this gap to tower over the boulder and shade it with a canopy that juts out about a dozen feet beyond the boulder halves in all directions. The oak's trunk has a diameter of a little over four feet, so it can be squeezed past on both sides to traverse the entire crack through the boulder and reach behind it, where a second oak is growing deformed, curving up from the ground to run horizontal at about human waist level. This flat run of the living duskwood is being used as an altar of Sylvanus. Behind it is a small hillock covered with herbs growing wild that of course have of course been planted there. And the hillock has a living vine curtain for a door across a cave mouth. Beyond the curtain is a small round room with a spring rising in its center to run out the back of the room and sleeping platforms curving all around the edges of the room. One of the four guardians will be sleeping here while another is out staffing the shrine, tending herbs and other growing plants like a gardener. The third and fourth will be elsewhere as they work in shifts. The top foliage of the living horizontal oak forms a barrier on one side of the shrine and longthorn bramble bushes ring the boulder in a broad barrier curated by the shrine staff, of course, on all sides of the split boulder and the hillock behind it, except for the side facing the high road. The Four Guardians, Bertha Tullman, neutral good human female cleric of Sylvanus, level nine. A veteran adventurer, she is kindly and pleasant, a plumpish, buxom, five foot seven, middle-aged, short-haired brunette who wears dark clothing, is armed and is always alert for deceit and any visitor surreptitiously taking something or leaving something. Cathara Nelver, neutral good human female cleric of Sylvanus, level 13. Also a veteran adventure, she's a smiling woman of few words, tall and rangy blonde with thigh-length flowing hair, big brown eyes, graceful and nice silent movements, and a habit of humming to herself under her breath. Galavhanna Hurlmaster, neutral human female cleric of Sylvanus, level 14. A short, as in five feet nothing, brown-skinned woman with brown eyes, back of knee length black hair, clothes of overlap mismatched dark furred hides and soft high boots of the same furred hide style. She can be aggressive and curt if suspicious of strangers, and she usually is. She was also an adventurer and the sole survivor of two different adventuring bands that went down to death, so she's rather grim. Falaname Tirist, neutral good human female cleric of Sylvanus, level 16. Six foot seven tall and of slender build with big blue eyes and fine aquiline features that suggest elf blood way back in her heritage somewhere. She has glossy, curly, waist-length red hair, a ready smile, and a calm, serene manner that hides swift readiness for battle. She wears old, worn clothes as if she's a farm laborer, but they hide several magic items useful in a fight. So, all pleasant folk, but well-armed and both used to and ready for fighting if trouble erupts. Hidden Hail is a spelljammer launch and landing site used, rarely, by certain Evermeet-based Elven Armada spelljamming ships wanting to introduce or remove envoys or influential elves and, occasionally, small portable cargoes of value to and from Waterdeep. It is also used by A. The veteran spelljamming voyager Drauntz Velvrath Chaotic Neutral Human Male, Rogue 14, Wizard 6. A traitor of few scruples and, some say, a sideline in piracy. He's a sly, sardonic, unreadable face sort. Handsome and well-dressed, his clothes conceal a small arsenal of magic weapons, various enchanted swords and daggers, including Return to Hurler Boomerang Fangs, and useful in combat items, such as beads of force and iron bands of Bilaro. 
who owns and runs the hammer ship Glasra's Gauntlet. Glasra was the lady pirate he loved, slew, and took the ship from. Employing a Grand Helm or a Major Helm, he has both aboard, plus a Minor Helm well hidden in the ceiling of his own cabin. The Velvrass are a large, far-flung family of half-elves and humans spread across known space, so Draunce has many allies and reinforcements he can call on. He's well-liked by his kin and has aided them often enough that he's owed many favors. B. The irrepressible flirt and fast talker and scamp, <laughs> Javar Arflam, chaotic neutral, halfling male, wizard 13, rogue 7. A tireless, always 16 irons in many fires, six escape plans up both sleeves, bundle of energy, who never sleeps and is deemed insane by his loyal crew of, yes, pirates, who can act respectable for days at a time if they absolutely must. Many of them are women of various races and hardened adventurers. Javar and they all sport many spoke bombs, beads of force, and bone balls, spheres of undead human and monster skeletons in stasis that open up and awaken when fired or when they strike a solid object after being rolled out into wild space like depth charges that they can use to hide behind, cause mayhem amid foes with, and so on. They are a trigger-happy lot. Javar helms a tradesmanship called the Luck Banner. By the use of a bardic helm or a minor helm, he has both aboard. His crew festoon the ship with lingerie-dominated laundry on shade-the-deck lines. C the ponderously strutting, many-scarred, flirtatious mountain of fierce tusk, feminine flesh that is Varbardra Kvuth, chaotic evil, scro female, fighter 17. A leering, gleeful she scro of great strength, party piece, bending iron bars or foe's weapons with ease in a bare hand's grip, who loves personal brawling but is a renegade when it comes to the usual aims of Scro society. She's interested in wealth and peaceful trade, including smuggling, but not piracy, but not in war. She and her crew of battle-hardened Scro take their rusty flapping armor plates festooned mantis ship, the Iron Fist, from port of call to port of call by means of a captured Orbis whose very existence would enrage any beholders who discovered it. And she has a minor helm hidden away as a backup because she doesn't trust any beholder in any matter at all. She won't break bargains with clients who don't double cross her and so is far more reliable than most to deal with despite her won't you be my lunch manner. Two, northeast of the Karen Road map tag on the same map, in between three hills, is another tiny valley. If you instead consult the Deserin Valley Mike Schley map, this same spot is five hexes due east of Red Larch and six hexes due west of Summit Hall, in the gap between three hills located in the heart of that hex. Spell smugglers and fast cargo spelljammers use this as a set-down point and usually use pack mules to transport goods southwest and northeast from campsites that the, they deliberately vary all along the roadside on the Karen Road. These smugglers include D. The tall, gaunt, Farlira Flamebeer Deathchaunt, chaotic neutral, human female, wizard 19, rogue 4. A whimsical, brilliant, some say unhinged, mage adventurer who wears a magnificent scarlet false beard, but is otherwise spectacularly female. Great looks, scanty clothing, save for many crisscrossing belts and baldrics, a bristle with leather spell scroll tubes and leather cupped potion, stainless steel potion vials, leads a ragtag ex-adventurer crew on money-making runs of drugs, weapons, magic, kidnap victims, escaping fugitives from justice, and the like. Her command is an octopus ship, Height the Searing Kiss, 
and it's powered by a major helm. She has a backup hidden aboard. The Kiss is armed with the usual two heavy ballistae and two heavy catapults. Farlira has been known to crawl into a rope harness on the bowsprit and doze there or serve as lookout as a shapely figurehead of sorts. She owns a four mouth tentacles tentacle mask that reflects back all psychic damage at its source, makes her immune to all mind flare grapple attacks, and stores six arcane spells cast into it earlier that she can cast forth by silent effort of will. No action needed, so it can unleash a spell in the same round in which Farlira casts a spell by normal means, that makes her look like an, Ill an illithid when she wears it. It confers no mind flare attacks. Farlira usually loads it with multiple magic missiles. And E, the cigar smoking, gravel voiced, usually cynical and sarcastically complaining, neutral evil goblin male, Fighter 7, Rogue 10, Cargrel Hustrike, who leads a crew of goblins fanatically loyal to him and controls a shield guardian, personal bodyguard he calls Steelhead. Cargrel loves to dicker and scavenge, often plucking up things that don't belong to him as he sails past, and he captains <laughs> the Bentlam's Bold Bitch, a squid ship fitted with a piercing ram but no missile hurling armament. By means of a major helm, he has a miner aboard as a backup. Bentlam was the goblin builder and skipper Cargrel murdered so as to come into ownership of the bitch. He is always busy, always flitting somewhere, tirelessly making coin while others sleep. 3. Just off the center left edge of the Schley map and visible on the Enverunza Waterdeep map as between Crypt Garden Forest and the Westwood, where they come closest to meeting, that is the narrowest gap between them, is a third Spelljammer landing spot, where a ship can anchor to a quintet of standing dead trees with ready access to the Keldel Path. This is the least private of the three near Waterdeep sites, and so the least used. However, it is also used in a pinch by smugglers and fast cargo spelljammers, um, see what I've said already for the roster, particularly when they find the northeast of Cairn Road site in use by someone else. And there you have it. How to get aboard, or disembark from a spell jamming ship within easy reach of the City of Splendors. Oh, just one more thing. The routes and sites I've mentioned are not unspied upon. Govern thyself accordingly, as Elminster is wont to say. Realms Forever. Realms Forever! Is another. My teleprompter rushed ahead, oh, like, no. like three paragraphs. <laughs> Neutral evil, Jubis male. <laughs> you see, you seem so confused by your own thing. <laughs> well, because that's not what I wrote. <laughs> but you're right. I imagine it's goblin. Okay, so, um, <laughs> let let me just yeah. Okay. Jubis male. <laughs> the way we say goblin here. Say hi to the camera. Hi. Hi, Raj. Raj, say hi to the camera. What? Yeah, we need some outtake stuff. There you go, Raj. Yeah, look at you, handsome. It's probably completely out of focus, but you know what? It's okay. I'm sorry you're not properly lit. The Rembrandt lighting doesn't work on the doggy punum. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Roger. Hey, Raj, what do you think, bud? Man, That's he is really interested in whatever you had for breakfast and still resides in your beard. He just wants a little love. Don't we all just want a little love? To post an outtake, it'll just be Roger being like <laughs> directly into the mic. <laughs> All right, come on, buddy. <laughs>